Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber White House Farm podcast. This episode raises the issue that Ann Eaton had financial incentive to testify against Jeremy Bamber. Firstly, the secret land deal raises Ann's clear and direct financial motivation, which was not disclosed to the jury when they asked. This is further indicated by Anne's involvement in receiving stolen jewelry from June Bamber's body and taking cash and valuables from the Bamber's home. Anne's obsession with the Bamber estate grew from her discovery that she had been left a paltry sum in the Bamber's wills, and she made records listing financial assets, lump sums, and gifts her aunt and uncle had given to their children, Sheila and Jeremy. Finally, you'll learn how police eventually gave in to the constant badgering by Anne and her family, and eventually accepted her evidence despite having to edit statements both before the trial and for later police investigations. Anne's meddling in the case was so virulent that she was investigated by the City of London Police alongside her father in 1991, but as proof of this would have undermined Jeremy Bamber's conviction, her statements were buried for the greater good in maintaining Jeremy's wrongful conviction. Jeremy's cousin, Christine Ann Eaton, who preferred to use her middle name of Anne, was born on the 26th of September, 1949, and is the sister of David Bowflower and the daughter of Robert and Pamela Bowflower, Jeremy Bamber's maternal aunt. Anne was 36 at the time of the tragedies at White House Farm. From the outset, she viewed Jeremy with suspicion, which she relayed to the police at every opportunity, actively looked for clues, tried to influence the police investigation, and lied regarding knowledge of particular facts, all to implicate Jeremy in the murders of his family. Essex police appreciated contributions from the relatives, and as set out in a quote taken from the handwritten notes made during the 1986 Dickinson inquiry, they viewed her meddling in the police investigation as helpful, stating, it was only the activity and persistence of the relatives which ultimately led to the truth being revealed. However, the truth of the matter is that the activity, persistence, lies, collusion, and interference in the case and the clear financial motive of the relatives ultimately led to the conviction of an innocent man. There is a common saying that money is the root of all evil, and if you follow the money to get to the heart of acts of corruption and scandal, you can understand how Jeremy's relatives were driven by financial matters from the day of the tragedies. As a collective, they believed that the cuckoo in the nest, as Jeremy's uncle Robert referred to him, should not and did not have any entitlement to any of the family treasures as a result of him being adopted and not a blood relative. Immediately after the tragedies, the wider relatives, in particular Robert Bowflower, deliberately removed Jeremy from the will of his maternal grandmother, Mabel Speakman, even before Jeremy became a suspect. In addition, it appears that the Bowflowers and Eatons took every step necessary to disinherit Jeremy from not only his parents' and sisters' estates, but that of his grandmother too, and this was weeks before Jeremy was investigated by the police. The only way to obtain the financial rewards from Neville, June, and Sheila's estates was for Jeremy to be convicted of the murders. Had Jeremy not been wrongfully imprisoned, he would have owned 50% of the caravan park and been sole beneficiary of multiple acres of land and several properties and businesses owned by his parents. He would have inherited Sheila's apartment in Maida Vale and owned his own cottage in Goldhanger and would have had a 50% share of his grandmother's estate after her death. As a result of inheriting 50% of Mabel's estate, some of the properties, land, and business concerns of his remaining relatives would have been in shared ownership with Jeremy Bamber. In addition, had Jeremy been acquitted, the Bowflowers would not have inherited Neville, June, and Sheila's estates, as they did after the guilty verdict. Not long after the tragedies, Anne and her family applied for the tenancy of White House Farm, which they got, and then moved in. In 2002, the Metropolitan Police attended White House Farm to see if they could obtain any DNA evidence from the farm, as many of the furnishings, fittings, and decorations still remained the way they were on the night of the shootings. Indeed, in 2004, Ann Eaton showed a camera crew from ITV1 around the house where five of her relatives died without even batting an eyelid. The kitchen was exactly as it had been in 1985, and so was much of the house. Previously, Anne had also worked with a television company to make a drama on the tragedy for ITV1, 
where she was portrayed by actress Diane Keene. She has also worked with authors of books on the case and other documentary makers. Anne Eaton has actively courted the media and gained notoriety and money as a result of Jeremy Bamber's conviction. During the Metropolitan Police investigation for the 2002 appeal, police forensics officers pulled up carpets and obtained DNA from the floorboards in the master bedroom of White House Farm. As in a statement, D.S. Grader, who examined the bedroom, said, I took possession of a bedside lamp, which had apparent areas of dark staining on the lampshade. This lamp was in the main bedroom on top of the bedside cabinet to the right of the bed. I recognized this lamp from the scene photographs taken in 1985 as being identical to a bedside lamp which was in the main bedroom on the night of the murders. Curiously, Anne and Peter Eaton had preserved so much from the tragedy, including a potentially bloodied lamp. In addition to this, the wallpaper was also the same as in the crime scene photographs and the master bedroom had barely changed at all. The material referred to in this podcast comes from Anne herself in her statements and notes. At the suggestion of Essex police, Anne kept meticulous record of events and her own actions to obtain the conviction of Jeremy Bamber. These include statements which were damaging to Jeremy, some of which had up to four draft copies, with parts redacted before the final one was submitted to the courts, as well as note cards and diaries. During 1991, the relatives, including Anne, were investigated for their conduct in implicating Jeremy Bamber in the murder of his family. They made further statements to this investigation, again, with a number of drafts being written before they settled on their story. Additional evidence comes from statements made to the Metropolitan Police during the 2001 investigation in the run-up to the 2002 appeal. At trial, the jury asked about the possible motivation for the relatives to lie, and whilst they specifically asked about Robert Bowflower, they also asked if the family stood to gain financially. The jury note to the court reads as follows. If Jeremy Bamber was found guilty and imprisoned for many years, who would be the beneficiaries of the Bamber estate and monies? Could it be his uncle and family? A possible reason or motif for Robert Bowflower's statement about Jeremy's being able to kill his own parents. There was no satisfactory response given to the jury on this question. They were simply given a statement from Robert Bowflower in which he lied about his financial worth and the issue regarding the other relatives was not addressed at all. Anne Eaton had an additional and more personal incentive to lie, which the jury were not made aware of at trial. Her husband, Peter Eaton, had been in farming all his life, working firstly for his father. When he died, Peter inherited half of the land his father had farmed. The remainder of the land was left to Peter's brother, John, and later John's land became central to a secret shared by Anne, Peter, and Neville Bamber. In a witness statement written in 1985, Anne Eaton gave evidence that In May 1984, my husband Peter and I returned from a fishing holiday in Aberdeenshire. On our return, my husband received information from his brother, John Eaton, that our tenant and farm had been sold without any consultation. This had nothing to do with my side of the family. I took advice from my parents. My father advised me to consult with Uncle Neville Bamber because he was aware of the procedures for tenants renting farms, White House Farm being such a farm. My husband and I consulted Uncle Neville Bamber, and I personally feel that I got very close to my uncle during this part of 1984. Most of the dealings were kept secret because there was a piece of land, approximately 50 acres, that I wanted my Uncle Neville Bamber to buy. Peter Eaton also spoke about this in 1986 when he was interviewed for the Dickinson Inquiry, which recorded, Peter later discovered that the land his brother was farming was to be sold to property developers from London, and so a confidential approach made to Neville who purchased the land to allow Peter and Anne to farm it. No mention by Neville to anyone about him purchasing this land, not even to June. Essex police also kept this land deal secret, as Jeremy was oblivious to it until after the trial. The fact that this land, that had been integral to the farm and had previously been owned by Peter Eaton's father, would have been owned by Jeremy Bamber was of great concern to Anne and Peter Eaton. Neville had kindly agreed to purchase the land and sell it back to Anne and Peter once they could afford to buy it. Clearly, if Jeremy were to become the owner of the land, then he may well have just sold it to a third party, 
leaving the Eatons with a much smaller, less viable farm. Shortly before 9 a.m. on the 7th of August, 1985, Anne received information from the wife of one of the workers at White House Farm that there were police with dogs and marksmen there and the lane was closed off. Anne telephoned her parents to tell them. David, who was at his parents' home, tried to bring the farm before calling the police, who were unable to divulge any information. Soon after, once they learned that the rumors were true about the tragedies, Anne and her family made the decision to go to Jeremy's cottage in Goldhanger. Anne was the first to arrive, followed later in the morning by David, and later still Robert and Pamela. Anne sat next to Jeremy as he gave his initial statement to the police and took notes of everything he said. Anne stayed at the cottage all day, until the police left in the evening, but before she went home, she asked Jeremy if she could have his mother's rings. She explained to the police in 1991 that, Before I left Head Street that day, I asked Jeremy if my mother could have Aunt June's engagement ring, because she had told me she wanted to hold Aunt June's ring. But he was adamant. No was the answer. He wanted it buried with her and wanted to keep the house as a shrine. He never gave in. Never, and still hasn't. In 2013, Jeremy discovered documents that established June's wedding and engagement rings were removed from her hand during her post-mortem examination. But rather than these being given to Jeremy, her next of kin, they were later given to Anne Eaton by a police officer without consent being obtained from Jeremy. Until the disclosure of these particular documents, Jeremy had always believed that his mother had been buried with her rings as she had wished. Anne later advised Essex police that she had made a conscious effort to look for any marks on Jeremy's arms that would have indicated he had been involved in a struggle. However, she failed to see any. This fact seems to have led her father, Robert, to decide that Jeremy must have worn a wetsuit whilst committing the murders to protect himself from receiving cuts and bruises. This, of course, was a ridiculous suggestion with no evidence ever produced to substantiate it. At Head Street, most people eventually left the cottage, with the Bowflowers and Eatons going to Anne's home at Oak Farm, where a discussion took place about the events of the day, and according to their evidence, they discussed why they believed Jeremy was lying. On the 8th of August, Basil Cock, the executor of the estates, who was also Neville's accountant, advised Jeremy he would need to accompany him to the solicitor's office to make arrangements regarding the running of the business. The harvest was continuing, and the farm had to be managed and wages paid. Once the management of the businesses had been established, with Peter Eaton, Anne's husband, being named as temporary manager, Jeremy was told the contents of his parents' wills. When he got back to his cottage, he shared this information with the other relatives who had gathered, waiting eagerly to see what they would inherit. The news was disappointing for them, as they stood to inherit very little. Aside from what had been bequeathed to their children, Jeremy and Sheila, Neville left nothing to the Bowflower family and just 250 pounds to his goddaughter, Anne Eaton. June left nothing to her sister, Pamela Bowflower, or Anne Eaton, with just 100 pounds bequeathed to her godson, David Bowflower. In fact, June left 1,000 pounds to her housekeeper, Jean Boutel, which was considerably more than to her own relatives. June also specified that all of her jewelry was to go to Sheila and Jeremy. This speaks volumes about the relationship between the relatives and the Bambers, and strongly suggests the reasons for their growing animosity towards Jeremy. On the 9th of August, Anne went to Witham Police Station, accompanied by her brother David and cousin, Anthony Pargeter, to state their suspicions about Jeremy and to learn whatever facts they could. The relatives were told that 24 shots had been fired, all of which had hit their targets. A detailed study has been made of the case material, and evidence now shows that not all the shots had hit their targets, even with firing at very close range, and at least 30 rounds had, in fact, been fired. This evidence is being put to the Criminal Cases Review Commission and makes up part of the submission issues. After being told this active case information by police, the relatives began being very vocal and repeatedly told DCI Taft Jones, DS Stan Jones, and DI Bob Miller, who were in the office, that they did not believe that Sheila could have committed the crime and pointed the finger at Jeremy. After being told they had been wholly excluded from the Bamber estate, they were very angry and agitated about the situation. All the while, Anne was continually scribbling down everything that was said onto her note cards to the point where she records, 
DCI Jones went very red in the face, stood up and said in an extremely angry manner, I don't have to put up with this and stop writing, and threatened to throw us out of the police station. Nonetheless, after everyone had calmed down, the onslaught of questions and opinions continued. Anthony and David listened to what the police had to say before agreeing that, in fact, Sheila could quite easily have committed the murders. In particular, David Bowflower confessed that he had in fact taught Sheila how to use a shotgun. Anne later informed the City of London police that, I do remember the police saying, Now do you believe Sheila could have done it? I remember David or Anthony or both saying or agreeing, Perhaps she could. Anne, however, during the remainder of the meeting, and ever since, maintained that she thought it would have been impossible for Sheila to have committed the murders. Before the meeting ended, D.S. Jones asked Anne, If you accused him and later found out you were wrong, how would you feel? Anne shockingly replied, I could live with that. After the meeting ended, Anne asked Jeremy, who was oblivious to the fact his wider relatives had been informing the police they believed him to be guilty of the murders, if she could have the keys for the farm when the police finished their searches. She told Jeremy this was to clean up, and so he signed a letter of authorization for the police to give her the keys. That evening, Anne and Peter were met by D.S. Stan Jones and D.C.I. Taft Jones, who escorted them around the house, showing them where each of the bodies had been found. D.S. Jones also pointed out damage that had been caused in the aftermath of the events by the raid team, particularly the damage which had been caused to the door of the cellar. Anne noted additional damage she saw of a broken light shade she believed was caused by the police. Oddly, although she set out additional issues, such as the missing coal scuttle and that the table and chairs were not in the normal position, she made absolutely no mention whatsoever of any scratch marks being present under the mantel shelf of the aga. But of course, why should she? Because the evidence now shows these were caused by the police on two separate occasions after the incident. Indeed, some of them were in fact made in the presence of Anne Eaton. Anne detailed later in the investigation that during this initial look round White House farm, she saw a tampon holder on a table in the lounge. This tampon holder later featured in one of her father Robert's strange and fanciful scenarios of events when he became convinced that the tampon must have been used to clean the sound moderator and he demanded tests be conducted. Essex police were all too happy to oblige and ran tests which produced negative results. The next morning, on the 10th of August, 1985, Anne returned to White House Farm, and as she stated at trial, this was to look for clues. Robert and David soon joined her at the house, and by late morning and early afternoon, the beneficiaries were gathered, along with the accountant, Basil Cock, and Neville's secretary, Barbara Wilson. In witness statements, the relatives said that besides cleaning the house, they were also present to allow Basil Cock access to the safe to collect important paperwork. However, the beneficiaries, it seems, had another motive for being there, because as well as looking for clues, they also began to remove items of value from the house. This included searches for cash, as Anne revealed in 1991 in a draft statement in which she said, I also recall looking through Aunt June's handbags, looking for cash, and someone telling me she did or didn't use some of them. She also said, We looked in Aunt June's handbags and purse. There were several about. I didn't know which her current one was. She also told the City of London Police that, I had no idea of Granny Bamber's things in the house except the jewelry, which we found when opening the wardrobe door in the spare room. I recall that one of the items of jewelry was Aunt June's locket and some of the other items were Granny Speakman's. The property of Jeremy's paternal grandmother, Beatrice Bamber had absolutely nothing to do with the Bowflowers and Eatons, and yet, it appears, the Bowflowers and Eatons took it anyway. Not satisfied with stealing from her dead aunt and cousin, Anne wrote in a draft statement that her father stole 400 pounds from Neville Bamber's wallet and was also searching the pockets of Neville Bamber's clothing for cash. Dad looked for Uncle Neville's cash in trouser pockets, etc., and also for other cash. In a statement written in September 1985, Anne said that Jeremy said that he didn't want anything taken out of White House Farm. But she also stated that Mr. Cock, the executor, had authorized that items could be removed and taken away for safekeeping. However, in his evidence, 
Basil Cox said that the removing of valuables from the house was arranged by Anne Eaton, who stated that Jeremy had asked that we do so. Therefore, it appears that Anne told Basil Cox that Jeremy had given his authority to remove items of value and told the police Mr. Cox authorized this. The only conclusion that can be drawn is that no permission had been given for any items or cash to be removed from White House Farm, and yet hundreds of pounds worth of cash and valuables were being taken against Jeremy's express wishes. In her evidence, Anne Eaton described buckets containing clothes she saw in the kitchen of the house and said, There were also three buckets in the kitchen containing washing in soak. One contained two pairs of blood-stained ladies' knickers. She expanded on this at trial and stated that there was a green bucket with two pairs of knickers in soak and another bucket with some children's clothes. I think it was a blue bottom of a tracksuit and a pair of socks. There was also a dishcloth in soak on the sink. However, photographs taken by Essex police on the 7th of August 1985 revealed that there were just two buckets, and although they did contain clothing, there appears to be no water in them, and the clothing did not appear to be wet. Anne further discussed how she washed the clothes from the buckets in the kitchen sink, put the garments back into soak before then deciding to throw them away in the kitchen bin. But evidence included in her handwritten note cards appears to indicate that she didn't throw the items into the kitchen bin, but took them home with her. She wrote, Anne washed floor, asked Uncle Neville for a clue. Sheila had a period, blood knickers, bucket and kids clothing and water I threw out and brought here. Does this mean she threw the water away that she herself had put in the buckets and then took the items home? We believe it does, although it seems odd that Anne would want to take these items home with her. During the 1991 City of London police inquiry, Anne revealed that she had subjected the knickers to a more thorough examination than merely being looked at and also revealed for the first time that DSI Ainsley had guided her on how to answer if she was questioned about the blood on the underwear in court. She stated, He, Ainsley, told me that when it comes to the trial, they, the defense, will allege that I put the blood inside the silencer and that Sheila's underwear could be a source of that blood. I must point out that I had never thought of that possibility, and I certainly did not plant blood of any description inside the silencer, and to my knowledge, neither did any other member of my family. I recall Mr. Ainsley asking me how I knew it was menstrual blood, and I answered his question in my normal forthright way. It smells different, doesn't it? This appeared to deflate Mr. Ainsley, who then countered, If you are ever asked at court, you make sure you tell them that. The underwear were quite badly stained in the crotch area, and I thought that Sheila had been caught out by her period. I feel that I should make it known that this conversation with Mr. Ainsley has what I can only describe as haunted me, by that I mean that someone might suggest this to me. This extract is very telling, in that Ainsley had to warn Anne that she may be accused of planting evidence. On the 12th of August, Anne persuaded Jeremy to visit the farmhouse, asking him over for a coffee. He decided he would go, but only if Julie accompanied him for moral support. Before Jeremy arrived, Anne busied herself about the house, instructing her eight-year-old daughter, Janie, to help her make up the beds in which the twins had been shot and killed. She says in evidence that, Shortly before he actually arrived, my daughter and I remade the beds in the twins' room. She elaborated further in her note cards, writing, Janie and I just managed to get the twins' beds sorted out to one bed because it had upset Karen, David Bowflower's wife, so much the day before. So just in case he had not done it, we made it more bearable. Was this done to create a false impression that she had been busy cleaning as they had told Jeremy they had been? Otherwise, he may have wondered what they actually had been up to in the house over the previous three days. Years later, in 2010, David Bowflower admitted to journalist David James Smith that not only was a very young Janie deeply affected by visiting and eventually living in White House Farm, but so was her brother William. He said, I do know that the children have had some nightmares, not been very happy living there. It's hardly surprising. Karen, David's wife, added, I wouldn't have done it to my children, I have to say, but erm, I think Peter wanted to farm the land. Throughout her evidence from 1985 to 2002, Anne repeatedly and frequently appears to hold some disdain for the fact that Sheila and Jeremy were adopted, 
and about the privileges and financial assistance they were given by their parents, Neville and June. In just one single witness statement, Anne refers to June and Neville spending money on their children no fewer than 13 times. Here are just a few things she said. Sheila Bamber enrolled on a modeling course in London. I believe that Aunt June Bamber paid the course fees. Sheila was pregnant and the marriage was going to be held at Chelmsford Registry Office, followed by a reception at the Marks Tay Motel, Copford, all to be paid for by my Aunt June and Uncle Neville Bamber. Sheila and her husband, Colin Caffel, moved to northwest London. I believe my Aunt June and Uncle Neville Bamber helped them finance the purchase or rent of a flat in Hampstead. At this time, my Aunt June also offered to buy Sheila and her husband an antique shop that was for sale in Tolsbury. Aunt June Bamber then gave Sheila and her husband some more money to put down on a ground floor flat in Maida Vale. On one occasion, the company accountant attended and the question of director's fees was determined. Jeremy Bamber, although not a director, was awarded a thousand pounds as a consultancy fee. The Bambers had paid bills totaling 15,000 pounds. This could not continue and Sheila would have to leave the private hospital and go into a national health unit. Was any of this evidence necessary? What was Anne trying to prove? She only emphasized her own fascination with what her aunt and uncle did with their money. So, it seems that the police were more than happy to accept evidence from a witness who stood to benefit financially from Jeremy's conviction, and who had displayed very strong discriminatory attitudes to her cousins. It appears that the land owned by Neville and June was also a concern for Anne, as on her note cards, she records that she had been making enquiries regarding the value of specific acreages of land owned by the Bamber estate. One land purchase June had made, which Anne knew about, seemed to particularly upset her, and she included this in a statement. Anne said that she recalled a conversation she had with Jeremy in July 1985 about Neville's plans for renovating Vaulty Manor in the future using the money from the sale of land to do so. This would have included the land Neville had already secretly purchased for Anne and Peter to farm. On the same day, Anne said, Jeremy then continued by saying that Aunt June Bamber had in fact purchased the land and had almost finished paying for it. I've recently been told that the land is registered in Jeremy Bamber's name. I was very surprised about this disclosure and on arriving home was upset. I telephoned my father and told him and later told my husband. I then tore down all the wallpaper in the toilet. I state this because I felt that what Jeremy had told me was a threat. Anne also conducted valuations on flats which had been the result of a property conversion. Neville's parents, Herbert and Beatrice, had owned a beautiful large mansion house in Guilford named Clifton House, which had been left to Neville and her sister's children, Anthony and Jackie, when Beatrice died. The house was being converted into flats, and Anne's note cards reveal that she obtained valuations for them, as well as establishing the value of Neville's concern in the business North Malden Growers. In her note cards, she wrote, NMG, North Malden Growers, the late beans at Gardener's Farm need a fungicide spray now. 99-year lease with flats therefore reverts to family, the on responsible for London, etc. We on list for Gardener's five flats, Two flats sold should now be clear the bank man. Bottom, next one should clear the debts farm. Nearly sold. 17,000 pounds. Two flats left. Jeremy half. Anthony a quarter. Jackie a quarter. She not only established the market value, but also the rental value of the flats as being up to 100 pounds or 300 pounds a week furnished. Anne was fully aware that should Jeremy be convicted, and because Robert Bowflower had arranged for Jeremy's maternal grandmother Mabel Speakman to change her will and disinherit Jeremy, that Pamela would inherit Jeremy's share of these flats as they made up part of Neville's estate. Strangely, in 1991, for the first time, Anne Eaton gave information in her evidence to the City of London Police that she had been afraid of Jeremy almost immediately following the tragedy. She told the City of London Police Inquiry that she followed Stan Jones's instructions when he told her she had not seen numerous actions the police had done in her presence. She said, I have been asked why one of them told me that I have not seen anything in the lounge, Sheila's room, and kitchen. It is, I assume, because they didn't want anything getting back to Jeremy, which is something I would never have done anyway because I was scared of him. She also stated, 
I should point out that even to this day, I have never discussed my suspicions regarding Jeremy with either Barbara Wilson or Jean Boutel. This was because I was in fear of my life if Jeremy ever got to hear that I suspected him of killing Uncle Neville and the others. And it was really at this point that I certainly became deeply suspicious of Jeremy. Indeed, it was a frightening moment because I, or indeed we all, became extremely worried that Jeremy might realize we suspected him and come after us. I personally began to have trouble sleeping at night, thinking of him climbing through a window to get me with a gun. This may sound ridiculous, but it's true. This is all I had time to say or all I said. You must remember, I didn't want Jeremy to hear me. I didn't want to be killed next. In total, during her evidence to the police in 1991, she recorded on no less than nine separate occasions how afraid she was of Jeremy, saying she feared for her life. However, she had not said a single word about this in any of her previous evidence or at the trial. So why had she not mentioned this before? Had the City of London police ruled in Jeremy's favor regarding the complaints he made to them in 1990, which resulted in the investigation, there was a real possibility his conviction could have been overturned or at least returned to the Court of Appeal. As a result, so many key witnesses seemingly began to exaggerate and offer further evidence as it was important that Jeremy remain convicted. In addition, during this time, Jeremy's prison security status was lowered. Following this, and a report on it in the national press, the beneficiaries complained, saying that they feared for their lives if Jeremy were to escape. This impacted on the Category Review Commission, who upgraded Jeremy back to Category A prisoner again within months. This is an area we will discuss in detail in a future episode. But the evidence appears to show that Anne Eaton made up her fear of Jeremy because the evidence shows that in 1985, she displayed no fear of Jeremy at all and in fact put herself in situations which, if she was as concerned as she told the police in 1991, she would never have done. And here are just two examples of this. On Tuesday, the 13th of August, 1985, Anne invited Jeremy to her home at Oak Farm to show him a bouquet of flowers that she had received from him as a thank you for her help cleaning the farmhouse. Little did Jeremy know at the time that, in fact, her motive for cleaning the house included her looking for evidence, and he had no idea that she had stated to the police countless times that she believed Jeremy had killed his family. Whilst Jeremy was in Anne's home, she deliberately attempted to provoke him to get a reaction, a fact she disclosed in 1991 when she gave evidence. I remember there was a discussion with Jeremy regarding the flowers. I must have been looking for a reaction, and I told him that I thought that Sheila should have black flowers. This remark did or did not cause a reaction. A further example is that on the same day, Anne returned some of the guns which David had removed from the farm back to the care of Jeremy, which he later returned to the farm. One of these guns was subsequently stored at Sotheby's warehouse for safekeeping. Mr. Stancliffe, a director at Sotheby's auction house, gave evidence that Mr. Bamber's reasons for wishing to have the items at Sotheby's was that members of his family were coming to lay some form of claim to the property. So the question is, would someone apparently afraid for her life deliberately try to provoke a reaction from the person they claim to be afraid of, or return guns to them, especially considering that they were alone in the house together? Anne Eaton had been very descriptive to Essex police about the reasons why she claimed that Sheila was incapable of shooting her family. She gave the impression that she knew Sheila very well, but in fact this was far from the truth. Although she did have knowledge that Sheila had some mental health issues and stated that Sheila had suffered a breakdown, she did not know the extent of Sheila's problems and had not seen or spoken to her for a long time. In 1985, Anne told the police, I seem to recall that Sheila was living in London but have no knowledge of any address. But she was then able to describe how Sheila could not possibly have been involved as... Coupled with my knowledge of Sheila being uncoordinated with completely simple tasks, like missing the cup when pouring tea and missing the toast when putting beans on it, I began to find it amazing that Sheila would have been able to use such a weapon and kill people with it. This was not only very demeaning to Sheila Caffel, but it was also an out-and-out -out lie, because Sheila did know how to use a gun, 
and had done so in the past when Anne's brother David Bowflower had taught her to use a shotgun on a holiday in Scotland. In March 1985, whilst in the hospital, Sheila wrote to Anne from her hospital bed, sending her an open and candid letter. Anne revealed to the court during Jeremy's trial that she had received this letter, in which Sheila wrote, Dear Anne and Peter, I expect by now you have got wind of the fact that I am here. I didn't want everyone to know because I thought, as usual, they would get the wrong end of the stick. I am not in here because I am worrying about my body, so let's get this one perfectly clear. I could never look you straight in the face if you thought that, because it is all so futile. In fact, I couldn't possibly be in here for that, because to begin with, there is nothing especially terribly wrong with my body. In fact, when I had the twins when I was in hospital, they decided there was nothing wrong with my cervix and that I quite possibly had a sensitive womb, which is why I started off early. So in future, with God's blessing, I won't have any troubles. I'm sorry for saying this, but it is important. The reason I am here is because of general stress and haven't been taking care of myself. I didn't want to come in, but Dad said I should. I asked God into my life so I could understand Mum's moods more and become completely high on his love, so much so that I wanted to join CND, thinking I had a calling from God to sort the world's problems out myself. Then I got a thing about the CIA following me. I finally thought a friend was the devil, so I went through a tough time of unreality. But I am getting over it now and everything will be okay. I'm missing the boys. With love, Sheila. Anne Eaton had a very surprising reaction to receiving this letter and told the jury that after reading it, she simply turned to her husband, Peter Eaton, and I said, look, I have had a funny letter from Sheila. I was very busy at the time. I put it away and did not get it out until I gave it to the police. Too busy to reply to Sheila and too busy to telephone and certainly too busy to make the trip to go and see her cousin, Anne simply put the letter in a drawer and forgot about it. When Anne Eaton discovered Jeremy had said that on the evening of the 6th of August, 1985, Sheila and her parents were in a discussion regarding the future foster care of the twins, she asserted to Essex police that Jeremy was lying. DSI Ainsley recorded this information in his interim report dated 23rd September, 1985, for the DPP, in which he wrote, Eaton and other persons close to the Bamber family flatly refused to accept this being discussed. It is generally agreed that under no circumstances would June and Ralph have agreed to or even discussed such a thing. But this was not true. The relatives were fully aware that Sheila had help with the children in the past. In fact, Anne told the police that Sheila, however, soon found it difficult to cope with the twins in London. She often traveled to White House Farm, Tolson Darcy, and my Aunt June paid local girls to act as nannies. This allowed Sheila to relax and she was pleased to have others look after her children. This information was not disclosed to the jury, and they were told the only source of the foster care information was from Jeremy Bamber. But months prior to trial, Ainsley had multiple statements from foster carers who had looked after the boys, social workers who had worked on Sheila's case, and evidence from Colin Caffel's mother regarding her conversation with June about future foster care provisions. However, as so often has been the case, the handwritten statements were not typed up, therefore the defense and the jury did not see them. Following the disastrous meeting with DCI Taff Jones on the 9th of August, 1985, the relatives, but predominantly Anne and Robert, began to contact the police daily. Robert Bowflower spoke to Essex police 24 times and Anne Eaton the same number of times during a 28-day time period. During the majority of these visits, or telephone calls with the police, Anne and Robert made increased attempts to influence the police investigations. On numerous occasions, Robert contacted the police, predominantly D.S. Barlow or D.S. Jones, with attempts to have them investigate his personal theories as to what had happened. Anne preferred to make her approaches to D.S. Jones and D.S.I. Ainsley. In fact, we recently discovered in the case material evidence provided in the Metropolitan Police interview of D.S. Dan Jones from 2002 that he, Julie Mugford, and Anne Eaton discussed case issues together. Evidence has also been discovered which shows that D.S. Jones had been instructed to take a statement from Anne Eaton about a specific incident. This was regarding the fact that on 6th of August, Sheila had told Barbara Wilson that all people are bad and should be killed, 
and Barbara told Anne about this. Oddly, this information does not appear in any of Anne's statements, but is on her note cards. But then again, why would they include evidence that supported Jeremy's innocence when Anne had admitted she could live with that if he was wrongly convicted? The evidence shows that within a very short space of time, Essex police began to collude with the relatives and revealed confidential information on a regular basis about the ongoing investigation and forensic results they had achieved. Anne and Robert admit themselves during the City of London police inquiry that confidential information was shared with them, and this is also referenced in a diary written by Robert Bowflower. The collusion appears to have been primarily between DS Stan Jones and Anne Eaton. Examinations and the collection of evidence which Jones conducted at White House Farm was not only done in the presence of Anne, but Jones specifically instructed her not to disclose that she had seen anything. It appears that Anne was guided in what evidence she could and could not disclose in her witness statements regarding the police's actions. One example is from her City of London Police handwritten draft statements, where she wrote, In the spare room, Sheila's room, they asked me whose shoes the black canvas ones beside the wardrobe were. I said they were Sheila's. They looked big, they said. She had bloody great feet, or big feet, did I say? Well, they took the shoes and said something like, You haven't seen this. Another example is contained in the same draft statement where Anne wrote, In the kitchen, was this the time they asked about the telephone looking wrong? I can't remember. They went to the mantelpiece in the kitchen and scraped paint samples with a pen knife, I think, and then onto a handkerchief. I think. Stan Jones, D.I. Cook, Miller scraped siding, I think. Ask them. But I wasn't supposed to see what they were doing. Why, I don't know. Perhaps if Jeremy asked. Perhaps D.I. Jones asked. I don't know. And this did not only happen with seized exhibits, collecting paint samples, and damaging the aga, but also on tampering with the kitchen window. Again, in 1991, in a draft statement, Anne said... Robbie, Sergeant Robbie Carr, in kitchen, got out through same window. D.S. Jones can't put that in. And in a different draft, she stated, Police kept on saying, don't say anything to anyone. Why would D.S. Dan Jones advise Anne that she had not seen and was not supposed to see what they were doing in the house? And not only was she told she had not seen multiple actions by the police, but in 1991 was told she should not put this evidence in the final version of her statement. This is very odd. And of course, this was not included in any of her pre-trial statements, and as such, the defense and the jury were oblivious. Anne also admitted in draft copies of statements written in 1991, that much of the information she had knowledge of regarding all the initial aspects of the case against Jeremy had been told to her by either D.C. Barlow, D.S.I. Ainsley, or D.S. Stan Jones. She made comments such as, I would have found this out directly from Witham Police, as I was in frequent contact with them and putting them under pressure to give me answers. It also appears that she was shown witness statements made by other key witnesses, as she made notes which stated, Police did take him away for questioning. I asked police why so much interest in Matthew. Julie mentioned a Matthew in her 991. A 991 is a police statement. Her father Robert wrote notes such as, Met Barlow, Jones on leave, got the impression that the drug squad had come out to investigate Jeremy's house as a source of supply of drugs on Friday last, the day of the funeral, unaware that he was involved in this murder case. Hence their appearance at the funeral. This was all in confidence. Called in at Witham, Barlow was there. Suggested testing silencer for traces of fibers from sanitary towel. Expounded on my theory that the farm tracks could have been used on foot or on bicycle. Told the following in confidence. Robert went on to set out evidence regarding Sheila's mental health. The evidence Freddie Amami had given in statements regarding Sheila and her issues. Evidence from statements regarding Jeremy's police statements and the time of the telephone call Jeremy made to Julie. He was also told about a range of forensic examinations and results, including the bicycle and silencer evidence. Was this confidential information disclosed to give the key witnesses the opportunity to get their stories to tally with each other? It wouldn't be the last time this happened because we have recently discovered that in 1991, 
the relatives were given copies of the complaints and statements which Jeremy had submitted in order that they could have time to concoct a suitable response. This is shameful conduct for an investigating police force. The fact that they manipulated what was said in final statements is evidenced by the fact that multiple draft copies were written before final ones were decided upon. The draft statements have proven to be particularly revealing to us as we have been able to see exactly what evidence they contained which was omitted from the final statement. And no wonder, considering the evidence they contain would have assisted the defense considerably. We believe that Essex police and the relatives never thought for a second that these would be disclosed. In this episode, we've explained how Anne and her husband Peter had a vested interest in Jeremy Bamber's conviction, primarily because of the secret land deal with Neville Bamber, which was unknown to Jeremy, but would mean that he would inherit part of the land they farmed. Anne's intention to steal jewelry from the body of her aunt as it lay in the mortuary awaiting burial and, in combination with her searches of handbags owned by June and Sheila just days after their tragic deaths, shows a persistent concern with the Bamber's money. The absence of any substantial inheritance from June and Neville Bamber in their wills demonstrates that Anne was not close to the Bamber family, and it must have driven her to obsess about the Bamber's finances in her own personal note cards. Her time was consumed with writing lists of monies given to Jeremy and Sheila by their mother June, noting detail of Neville's interest in other companies, and writing comments on property which Neville owned with his niece and nephew, Anthony and Jackie. This evidence shows Anne's motivation to lie, which the jury had asked about, but did not receive an answer to. The evidence discussed in this podcast has been constantly ignored by those charged with protecting the interests of justice. But this won't continue because the Criminal Cases Review Commission are now investigating the actions of the police involved in taking these statements and other evidence, and police collusion with Anne Eaton, who made a healthy profit from the conviction of Jeremy Bamber. Anne's evidence raises some very serious concerns about the ethics of Essex police and the conduct of the subsequent investigations into the case by bodies put in place to regulate their conduct. Finally, of course, what if Anne Eaton herself Well, as she said, if Jeremy were convicted, I could live with that. Perhaps it is time the City of London police investigation was reopened, and Anne faced renewed questions about the evidence she gave to the jury. (laughs) 